Yep. So we're going to go ahead and get started. Gene, are we good from your side? Okay. We're set. Nathan so, L., in answer to your question, you are in the right place. All right. So hello and welcome to another Lunch and Learn session sponsored by A.T. Still University Information Technology and Services Group. And we do these sessions every couple of weeks. So every Tuesday at noon, mm -hmm. either on the Missouri campus or on the Arizona campus, we have these sessions. And they are broadcast using Google Hangouts uh, on air. And so if you followed us the last couple of weeks, there have been enough changes in Hangouts that we're really just starting to use the whole video TV terminology. So you can see we've got real video cameras now rather than a web camera. And you guys would be considered the live studio audience. This is our first studio audience of that. So our session today, we'd like to welcome to Season 2, Episode 3, an open forum with University President Craig Phelps and Senior VP for Academic Affairs, Norman Gevitz, up on the big screen. Do you want to switch over there, Corey? And uh, this is the second session. We did a similar session to this at the Arizona campus a couple of weeks ago. So it's just an opportunity for everyone at each campus, as well as our online uh, folks, to be able to ask questions to the big guys. So um, with that, before we get started, we actually have a couple of introductions to make. Uh, the first one I would like to uh, introduce. We're thrilled to have student involvement in these sessions. Uh, so I'd like to introduce Caitlin Schmidt. And Caitlin is the president of uh, the USA, the University Student Association, and a member of the ATSU KSUM class of 2015. Yep. So Caitlin, we'll give it to you. All right. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm calling to you today from my clinical rotations um, down in Farmington, Missouri. Um, and on behalf of the University Student Association, I just wanted to take a minute to welcome everyone and to thank Dr. Phelps and Dr. Kovitz for hosting this forum. Um, so a little bit about the University Student Association. Um, we are kind of like a student government um, in that we deal with different issues that are taking place across campus. Um, however, we are comprised of members from the Arizona campus, the Missouri campus, and online students as well. Um, so we're really looking to address university-wide issues. Um, things like interprofessional education and, and events that impact the entire university. Um, so it's a great chance to collaborate and really unite the campus and be one AT still um, university. So any questions that people have regarding that, they are more than welcome to contact us. Um, you'll see different events coming up this fall, like the collaborative case competition. Um, also, the mascot competition that just took place, those are all sponsored um, by the University Student Association. And then we also have another case competition in the spring called Clarion, which is nationwide as well. So we really look to get some national representation, too. Um, another thing to keep an eye out for is uh, we will be taking new members. Uh, you should see the applications in your email starting at the beginning of November and we'll be doing those selections towards the end of November and beginning of December. Um, so if anyone has any questions, feel free to contact us. Uh, we're here for you. So um, again, just thank you for taking a couple minutes to listen. And uh, thank you again, Dr. Gavitz and Dr. Phelps um, for visiting with us today. We appreciate it. Thanks, Caitlin. Thanks, Caitlin. And another introduction to make, we have Carl Bohm. Carl is the president of the uh, Missouri Campus Student Government Association. KCUNS is another Ah, I said uh, Missouri <laughs> Campus. You're right. KCUM. So, Carl, can you give us a quick update on what's going on with SGA? Um, so, with uh, with our Missouri Campus, we're just welcoming our new dental students, our dental class, as many of you know. Uh, I'll be working with uh, the dental students actually in the next week. We're going to be electing their own leadership. We'll have SGA representatives for them as well as class officers. Um, and so SGA will then uh, encompass all three of main campuses, our four, excuse me, our biomedical sciences program, um, our SHM that's uh, based here, as well as our DO class and then also our dental school. So we're looking forward to working with them. Their elections, like I said, start next week. And, um, that's really about it for SGA. We're looking forward to this meeting and hearing some things uh, from Dr. Williams and Dr. Phelps. Great. Thank you, Dr. Phelps. Thanks. 
All right. Well, welcome. Thanks for taking the uh, time to, to come virtually and physically to the open forum. And we want to tell you a little bit about uh, some of the initiatives that uh, we're working on this year and then certainly open it up for questions and discussions. So uh, as you remember last year, we tried to be clear and focus on some areas. And I think we made fairly good progress. Uh, Dr. Gevitz may talk a little bit about the progression of some of those uh, into this uh, academic year. And of course, this year we're focusing on things like scholarly research, uh, scholarly activity and research. And that was important to us because Dr. Hurd and the committee put together a very nice uh, research paper of what uh, ATSU should be thinking about as a, its role in research and scholarly activity. But we realized we had five new deans. And those five deans really hadn't had a lot of input into that document. So Dr. Hurd has uh, agreed to work with faculty and student input and to find out what kind of the, the next role or the next step is for scholarly activity and research at ATSU Still University. And that's, that's extremely important. So we want to thank Dr. Hurd for willing to kind of go through that process again to make sure we have a current um, applicable uh, model now uh, with the addition of, of our Missouri uh, School of Dentistry and Oral Health. The other is learning centeredness. Probably if I asked in this room, and this would be not a negative at all, uh, we'd all have a different definition of what being a learning centered university would be. I, I would have a definition I'm sure that might be and probably would be different than others. So I need to learn a lot about this. We have it in our mission statement and we have it in a lot of our documents. So we really need to kind of explore together what that means. Not only uh, the importance of how we work with our students and our faculty, and our staff and community, but when we do have accreditation visits and somebody brings up, well, what is that learning centeredness that you tout and you talk about? What does that mean? So this year we, we need to explore that and find out what that does mean. And then we know that we're a tuition-driven organization, and we'd like to become more mission-driven. And uh, there's a few ways you can do that. You can, you know, cut expenses, and that's always difficult to do because I think we have quality programs and a quality university. So if you start cutting expenses, then you probably most likely in some ways will start cutting quality. And sometimes that has to be done, right? There are, there are disasters that happen. There are market changes that happen. Uh, organizations and institutions have to adjust. Uh, but we don't, fortunately, feel those type of pressures now. But what we do feel is the pressure that our students feel when they have significant debt when they graduate. So we need to explore this whole idea of what advancement means to a university and what the culture of advancement is. And this campus has responded extremely well to our capital campaign. Uh, very exciting. In fact, uh, you know, I mentioned some things to our board, not anything specific, but in general, and the board's just excitement level about the things that advancement can do to help us reach the mission and to do the things that we would like to do for our students and our faculty and staff that we're unable to do now simply because, once again, there's, there's always a, a point where, you know, you have to put your tuition so you can stay competitive in the marketplace, but yet still try to meet the mission and let our students do the things they need to be able to do when they graduate. So that advancement culture and exploring advancement is really kind of the third area of focus that we're focusing on. And then we do a lot of other things that are just what I kind of call the, the business of the university, the day-to-day -day things. Uh, Virginia and her group with Greg developed the first marketing plan last year the university's ever had, which is pretty neat, right? So we did that last year. We worked on facilities, Dr. McManus and others worked on a facilities plan for both campuses, so we were able to, to move that forward. And there's a lot of just kind of day-to-day -day operational things that happen. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Gevitz now, and he's going to give you a little bit of progress on some of the areas that, uh, that uh, he's been able to uh, move forward just in the three to four months that he's, he's been on board. Uh, and I'll let Dr. Gevitz give an update. Norm. Thank, thank you, Craig. Um, I think the president spoke about what the uh, issues are for this forthcoming year. When I came aboard, there were three issues that uh, I came here to tackle. Uh, one was interprofessional education. The second was the development of a teaching and learning center. And the third was um, to uh, improve cultural uh, diversity. So let me, let me speak about uh, interprofessional education. On the Arizona campus and on your campus, uh, there will be the interprofessional case competition that will occur this Saturday. And what is amazing is we have a record number of individuals who are participating. We have 27 teams and 137 participants. And it is not only A.T. Still University, but it is also Truman State. Uh, it is also Grand Canyon. 
so um, this competition will, will take place, unfortunately, at the same time as the Biomedical Research Conference, and I will be back in Kirksville at the Biomedical Research Conference on Saturday. But we can see that efforts to establish voluntary interprofessional education are going forward. We have five individuals that um, Academic Affairs sent to the IPEC conference in Chicago, which is this year was sponsored by AACOM. And we sent five individuals, including two from the Missouri campus, uh, Allison Crutchfield and um, Trish Sexton. And they're coming back and much with great enthusiasm. And I've asked them to develop a project uh, which um, I hope that they will um, carry out in the next few months. And I've left it to them to design the project and whatever Barbara Maxwell and I can do to facilitate that, we will. In terms of IPE, I came in with an idea. And the idea was something that I had actually worked on 25 years ago, which is called stomatology. Stomatology was a medical specialty. It is a term still used to refer to what we now call dentistry in Europe and other countries. And the United States developed the first autonomous dental school in 1840 and awarded the DDS in terms of the Baltimore College that was established that year. And in 1867, Harvard University established its dental school and awarded the DMD and expected that its graduates would also pursue and graduate with the MD degree. The idea was that dentistry was a branch of medicine, a medical specialty. And indeed, through the latter part of the 19th century and into the 20th century, that it was treated as such. And there were annual meetings of the American Medical Association where there was a stomatology section, a recognized medical specialty interest group, and those physicians who also held dental degrees gave paper, published papers in JAMA, had associate members who were just dentists, and there was a close relationship between dentistry and medicine. As time moved on, uh, medical education grew from two years to four years, and the same is true of dental education, uh, medical education added internships and residencies, and the idea that one individual could pursue both degrees became unrealistic. Stomatology centers on the oral cavity and its adjacent structures. And I actually traced this movement in a paper that I wrote um, 25 years ago. And coming here and seeing all the health professional schools that we have, that it seemed to me that this notion of stomatology, that is, a focus on the oral cavity and its adjacent structures, could appeal um, to all of our colleges and most of our programs as an area that we could center interprofessional education and also, hopefully, interprofessional research. And what I've been doing over the last several months is meeting with the deans of each campus who have bought into the idea and a widening group of individuals, faculty, and staff on both campuses to facilitate discussions about how we might be able to encompass interprofessional education projects related to the oral cavity and its adjacent structures. At least one grant proposal has come out of that on one campus, and on another campus, Already we're talking about the pooling of resources for the teaching of anatomy and of dental students, um, PAs, osteopathic medical students uh, actually working together, learning from each other. So I'm, I am pursuing this project um, and with the cooperation of um, the deans and also a widening group of faculty and I hope to have more to report as we go on. A second area that I have been engaged in is the Teaching and Learning Center. And I have established a committee 
a broad section of faculty representing all six colleges and most programs. And the first order of business is to find a director of what I call the TLC, the Teaching and Learning Center. And we drew up a draft of a proposal for a director. We submitted that to the committee. The committee was wonderful in making changes, suggestions as to what should be the attributes of the individual that would head this center. Um, we revised the proposal. I submitted it to the president. He approved it. It has just been recently graded, and we will soon be advertising that position. The third area is um, cultural diversity. And um, my role in this has to do with the National Center for American Indian Health Professions. We've established an advisory committee. We have a new reporting mechanism. Uh, we have an extension of an existing grant. Uh, and we hope to make progress in that area. But the real coup has been uh, something that I was only peripherally part of, and uh, that was the hiring of Clinton Normore uh, as our new director of diversity. Uh, and um, he's wonderful and is going to make a real difference um, here at ATSU. So I will just end at that point and ask if there are any questions about any of these initiatives. It's a good place to start. <clears throat> Any questions about the areas that Dr. Gevitz touched upon? And we can come back if we have questions. Uh, uh, thank you, Dr. Gevitz. Uh, one of the things uh, that I was reminded of during Dr. Gevitz's uh, uh, talk, uh, thanks to um, Dean Halliday, I was able to spend some time with the assist, uh, Surgeon General of the United States and his, his assistant, which uh, was, was, was a wonderful experience. So I asked them, what does ATSU need to do to prepare our students to practice uh, for the next 10, 20 years? And uh, they had that question in advance, and so they were thinking about it. And uh, it's something that they study, right? They look at kind of the whole, think of, think of a satellite out there that's looking at the entire US and any area that it has influence on from Puerto Rico to the Western Pacific, right? And they're looking at the healthcare needs of this country, and then they're also thinking how it fits globally. But they're up there looking at some things, and they saw two things that they came up with right away. Number one is send us as many students to work for us as possible, <laughs> um, which was really cool because uh, the young lady who took me up uh, to the Surgeon General's office mentioned that there's somebody in their office who has graduated from two of our programs, our MPH program and our uh, Doctor of Health Education program, just in the Surgeon General's office in Washington, D.C. But the two things were, number one, uh, we need more physicians and we need them in areas and healthcare providers in general in areas where there are shortages. And once again, they're looking at it and they're seeing some very big pockets in future pockets of extreme shortages that will adversely affect the health and financial health of this country. So rural, urban, underserved. They get it, they understand it, we get it, we understand it. The second is IPE right? Interprofessional education, in which the role of everybody on the team is extremely valued, that uh, the physician understands the importance of working alongside every other member, and those members understand the importance of working together hand in hand. And one of the most difficult situations they have, once again, in looking at the healthcare needs of the United States, is a hierarchy that just isn't functional for many parts of our country and that everybody's going to have to work together in a different paradigm where everybody's practicing at the top of their capabilities and at the top of their licensing to even begin to meet the needs of what they see of this looming crisis. And there's all sorts of statistics and reasons that we can talk about and get into it. Then they talked about the three initiatives coming out of their office this year. Number one, it's the 50th anniversary of the research that came out on the negative effects of smoking. So think about that. Now, during my lifetime, for the young men and women here, um, young meaning chronically young, you know, the age-wise. I know Dr. Gavitz tripped over that uh, almost a little bit at the other meeting, but those of you who were not old enough to remember, there was a row on the airplane that you hated to be on. What row was that? The last non-smoking row, right? Because right behind you was a smoking section on an airplane, and all those people smoked. Hard to believe. You go to a basketball game at the Coliseum in Phoenix, and people were smoking in there, and you were kind of like partying the smoke so you could watch the players play. Uh, in California, some of our young men and women have probably never experienced smoking in a 
a bar or a music venue. That was common and is still common in many areas of the country today. But think about those games where over 40% of the population smoke down to now 18%. Well, they want to take advantage of this 50th anniversary to see if they can push that 18% down even further. So you're going to hear about that. The other two areas they want to focus on are physical fitness, being active. You know, the, the paradigm of, you know, of any activity is good. You don't have to run marathons or triathlons. Anything you do is good. Climbing stairs, walking to your car, doing things that add up each day to a healthy individual become very important. And then the third is refocusing on prevention. Kind of that's what they do, right? The Surgeon General's Office does that. But they've got to keep that message out there and come in different ways of encouraging people to think about prevention and do prevention. So kind of all things that are really right up kind of ETSU's areas of specialty. So we had a wonderful time together in a meeting together. And then I was able to go down and, and meet with members of, uh, of Congress and walk to the offices and have discussions. Every office I went to, they knew who A.T. Still University was. One office just had uh, the chief of, of the um, Congress man had just had his wife had graduated from her OT program on the Arizona campus. And uh, one son attends the DO school in Glendale, Arizona. So they all understand and they get this idea of A.T. Still University. But more importantly, they get the importance of clinical rotations and GME, graduate medical education, and the looming crisis that's there. And to have staunch Republicans say, boy, I was one of those big supporters of advancing GME, is a pretty significant uh, accomplishment for this profession and, and uh, the DO profession, the MD profession, and it creates awareness for all of our schools, the importance of society's willingness to let our students learn at the risk and the expense of the public through clinical rotations, whether it's in a dental chair with a young man or woman with a high-speed uh, drill or whether it's a, in a physical therapy office where one of our um, older adult students has come back and got a physical therapy degree or advanced degree and they're working on them in the clinic, you can see that there's a lot of trust built up with the public to allow our students across healthcare to be entrusted with the care of, of America's population. That's our most valuable asset. So we have to keep that, that, that wonderful partnership moving forward, and I think the people do get it. So just wanted to give you that update. Uh, let's see, I think this is probably a, a good time just to open it up for just general questions. Um, you know, if I don't know the answer, Dr. Gevitz may know it. If not, we'll, we'll try to find it for you. It's always good to try to keep the discussion at, at whatever level is appropriate. Uh, some of the times, you know, we, we don't know when the stripe's going to be done the parking lot or, uh, you know, what uh, what's going to be served tomorrow at uh, Straight A in, in Arizona. But uh, we can probably at least give you some information on some of the, you know, some of the uh, Priorities of the university. Oh, Kelly, I see you raise your hand. You sure? <laughs> Come on, no, you got it now. You're. Are you sure? Okay, that guy's everywhere, isn't he? Yes. Craig. Yes. If if they won't ask any questions, I'll start talking about the miniature baby donkeys. <laughs> well, we, we we'll pause for that. We do want to hear that, but but Bob has a question here. I guess I wanted to hear from Dr. Gavis a little bit more in the teaching and learning center. I guess the bigger picture and how, how does that, what does that mean for us? Okay. Right, let me describe what the teaching and learning center would, would do. Uh, when I first came aboard, I presented to the deans and the deans council uh, characteristics of what I thought that the teaching and learning center should have. Certainly, it should be a place where um, as a learning-centered university that we know more about pedagogy and styles of learning and try to facilitate understanding uh, and teaching in terms of what is, uh, what are best practices, what other universities are doing, how students can learn better. As to the center itself, I gave certain core characteristics that it is user-friendly, not intimidating. That's one reason why I want to call it the TLC, uh, the Teaching and Learning Center, uh, Tender Loving Care. One of the challenges that we have as a university is that we have these lunch and learn sessions, and often it is the same individuals who attend. Uh, and what I want to do is reach out to broader faculty, staff, students, to participate in these activities. I don't want to feel uh, individuals who have not participated before somehow will not be able to catch up. 
And one of the, the aspects that I, I talked with Brian about is certainly that we open this up to make sure we have the widest possible audience. Because just to, just to depend upon a small core group of faculty to take the lead in terms of innovations, I don't think we'll reach our mission. So that's one. Second, that it is largely virtual. It is adult learning centered. It encourages asynchronous as well as synchronous uh, learning. It facilitates both group and individual activities. It enhances continuing education. It, um, it serves the needs of both campuses and our virtual campus. It can be easily accessed by students, faculty, and staff. That's one of the virtues of it being uh, virtual, although we will have centers, per se. We will have space at both campuses where people can get help in terms of getting access, of, of learning how to use whatever system that we uh, develop. That aspects can be um, accessed by adjunct faculty. It's very important for our faculty in the field, our preceptors, whatever the program is, to have, if you will, certain benefits of being a university faculty member. And this is one of the benefits that we think that they would enjoy. It is intimately tied to the library. It is wide ranging with respect to its menu. It is, uh, promotes assessment. And most of all, it is cost effective. So that's what we like in the Teaching and Learning Center in terms of broad parameters. The reason why we are first seeking a director is we don't want to hamstring the director in terms of her or his vision in terms of the learning center. So at best, what I wanted to do, and which is shared by the faculty and shared by the committee that we set up at the Teaching and Learning Center, is to set up these broad parameters within which the director, whoever it may be, can actually um, construct the center in a way that is consistent uh, with her or his vision and fulfilling these broad parameters. Other questions? Yeah, I'll repeat the question. Uh, we had a board of trustees meeting last week. Uh, it, was a, it was a great busy week. If you're going to bring your board and, and show them a lot of things going on, it was a, it was a good time to have them. Uh, but uh, you know, our board is in charge of um, vision uh, achievement or attainment. And that's what our board does. Our board uh, comes together every 90 days volunteering, many of them with families and businesses that they lead. So think of that. They just left and they're already planning their next 90 days. Um, you know, uh, donate their time free to the university. Once again, they usually donate their travel expenses, <clears throat> and they often are give one of our some of our best givers. And uh, we have a, a last year had 100% giving. Uh, if you count uh, kind of the, the cal academic calendar year, 100% giving by our by our board, uh, and uh, they really feel that that's important. So the board uh, is in charge of the uh, the health of the university, and so they're making sure that everything that's being done is toward the vision achievement, which is to become preeminent. They're not a managing board. Some boards um, you may be familiar with actually get down in, in managing uh, the school system or managing the water supply or managing the city. This, this board is not a managing board. So they basically have set a set of metrics that they come and they review. And these metrics are really rotated around a number of uh, areas within our mission and our vision to make sure that we're doing the things that we need to do. So for instance, they are very uh, keyed in at this meeting to what is our student selection criteria? Are we selecting the right students that meet the mission? And are they performing well? And eventually, are they going out to areas that we talk about in our mission? So there are a sets of metri uh, set of metrics that have been developed with the board, staff, and faculty uh, to look at those metrics. 
Sometimes the metrics, metrics focus on things like asking, are our facilities plans in place? Do we have a risk management plan? Do we have a succession plan? So those were some of the areas that were looked up on at this meeting and decided at this meeting. But the most important time during the board meeting occurs outside of the board meeting. And those are when we develop specific times for the board of trustees to interact with our faculty, staff, and students. Good news is those are plenty. Bad news is we've got to make sure we utilize those times. So for instance, on Friday afternoon, our board, four or five, or four or five I think maybe six total, came with the new Mosdo students, because we have four dentists on the board, to talk with them. We had an hour and a half very wonderful exchange. The rest of the board of trustees went over to the reception area in um, the, um, the counts, let's see, what's up, what do we call the reception area? The Connell Center in that area and met with students from USA and other students and faculty and, and others. And it's those interactions where they get the kind of pulse, the feel of the university. So there were several of those that occurred throughout the, their time here, including standing around during the inauguration and post-inauguration where there were chances for them to bump into students, faculty, and staff. And then on Saturday evening, uh, Kelly, you disappeared. Uh, Kelly's band was, uh, or the band that Kelly's in was playing over at the Jackson Stables and we had one of our board member there, board members there, and we were able to take the board member around to meet students from KCM, to meet students from USA, to meet students from Mosdo. And it's those times where they really get the interactions of what you feel. But once again, it's only as good as you showing up and you participating and you asking questions. So you have access to the Board of Trustees that very few universities have. Oftentimes it's come in, give a report, see you later. I don't even like to give reports. I like to call them updates. So when USA comes to visit either in January or April, they'll give an update. Uh, we had a wonderful uh, report uh, from Dr. Chamberlain, not that the report was wonderful, but he came in and the report was okay. So <laughs> I don't want to get that. Let's see. Uh, let's see. So Dr. Chamberlain uh, gave a, a, an excellent report to the board of what's going on with the University Senate what are some of their issues uh, and concerns and what are they working on uh, and it was, was very well received. But once again, more importantly, is when they go down to those receptions and they're interacting with our faculty and our students. And then they, they get that knowledge and that wealth and that experience and then they look at those metrics and say, well, you know, that's a great metric, but, you know, I was talking to a few of your students and what about, why don't we adjust this metric so we're moving in this direction or why don't we think about this? Once again, it's happening at the most important visionary component that they can contribute the most as opposed to down trying to manage you know you know what type of um, uh, you know, doors we should have and screens and colors and slogans and things like that that's not their that's not their forte nor nor would it be good use of, of all of our time and resources to do that so that was a very very good question so we looked at the metrics regarding uh, student success uh, we talked about a number of the different job products. Of course, they, you know, they were able to attend a number of events. Uh, we had five new board members, and I think this is really important. Dr. Gavis uh, brought up about our diversity initiative last year that all of you had the opportunity to contribute to who were part of the university last year, and we appreciate that. That document has served as our, our roadmap. But we have five new board members, four women board members. We had one, only one previously. So it was pretty neat to look across that board and know that if we had an issue or a question that really needed to have a broad perspective, we were there. Dr. Wendell went to Washington, D.C. and met with the accrediting board there. Now, you, you know, we've got like 27 credit, accrediting bodies. Well, let's add another one. For some reason, District of Columbia thinks they should be in accrediting as opposed to other states license, and it's a long story. Uh, but everybody's getting into the business of, of collecting fees from universities to help fund their state or district. So Dr. Wendell went to this meeting and it seemed to be going well, very positive. They liked it. Uh, you know, you'd expect D.C. to be a little, you know, button down, collar, but uh, they, they were doing well. And at the very end or toward the end of the meeting, a, a, a student board member, a accrediting member pulled out and said, well, you know, that's great about ATC University, but I see that on your board of trustee document that was submitted prior to the board meeting in July, you only have one female on your board. Tell me about that. And Dr. Wendell was able to say, glad you asked. Diversity was initiative last year, and we went from one female member of the board to uh, five, which is approximately about a little over, less than a third of the board. 
And we also added a, uh, uh, an MD to our board, which is new to the history of this university. And it just so happens that the new MD member of the board is, gonna, is actually the chairman of NAC, National Association of Community Health Centers, the highest achievement that a, a physician can get at, the, at that level for community health centers. And so that's a process that you all were a part of. For once again, creating a strategic plan that talked about diversity years ago, 2008, 2009. Part of what we've done these last few years is pick targets that we think we can do. So there's 31 things on that strategic plan, and we can't do all 31 of them. But we can certainly do three or four a year, right? Get, get those done. And then the input about cultural competence, cultural diversity, all those areas that we talked about, hiring the right person, and our board understanding it. So the board saying, hey, if this is truly a strategic initiative of the university, let's listen to what they're saying and let's make sure that we're diverse too. That was a pretty pretty intense July board meeting because anytime you expand your board, think about it, it's logistics for five more people, it's orientation for five more people, it's cost to bring five more people. All those things occur, but the um, look that you get from their perspective is, is probably you know beyond value, and I can say that that happened this last meeting. So that's a very important thing that I thought You'd appreciate because you were all part of that diversity um, white paper and initiative and feedback. So, thank you. Other questions? Yep. Yes. Dr. Phillips, I don't know if it's so much a, a question or a comment. And a shameless plug for the staff council. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I got to admit, when I heard that, that Dr. Chamberlain had talked to the board, I, I got a little bit jealous. But I would I would like to extend to you the, the opportunity to meet for some staff council meetings as well. Sure. So that, that's Very good. We, we will uh, I will bring that up to the board chair. And knowing our board chair, he certainly uh, appreciate it. Once again, we try not to do an update. We can imagine if you're just doing these all board meeting long, then the visioning gets uh, gets done. And, and I want to apologize for not getting over to the staff meeting. Uh, I don't think that we could have scheduled more things <laughs> on Thursday and Friday. I just I don't know if, if the capacity of the town or the city could have handled more things. And so we came back from lunch right in the middle of my metric presentation, and Maureen's trying to pull me out the door, and the chair said, "Get up here and get started." And and, and then I then at, when we were done, I said, "Do I have time to get over there?" I think we we wrapped up around four, and I think by then you had um, appropriately moved on to your next. Uh, fun activity, um, but uh, but yes, I, I want to make sure I spend time uh, more time with the, the, the staff uh, council, and we want to. I will offer that to Dr. Uh, Drew and the board to consider uh, consider doing that. So, thank you. Ready for an online question? Sure. So we'll go from kind of the board to a program specific question. I'll try okay. to broaden it so it's not just one program. But the per the questions coming in. Are there plans to reestablish the American Indian track within the physician's assistant program? So that's the specific program. But let's kind of broaden it, maybe go to Dr. Gevitz or whoever wants to handle it. Kind of what are the future plans for all of the programs? We've seen a lot of expansion in the last 15 years. Wow. Boy, so we've got a lot of schools and programs. How much time do you guys have? Go for it. All right. Well, what we did last year was we uh, um, had some funds available for each of the deans uh, to kind of dream. And we gave them uh, support to, to dream about where they see their program going in, in five to 10 years. I think it would be, um, uh, to talk in the general term, I think what we see is some mild to moderate growth in programs. We didn't see any really just large trajectory in program growth. Um, of course, MOSDA was going through their formation, so they were doing their own strategic plan as they built their so they built their school, so Dr. Halley didn't have to create an extra document. We just gave him credit for uh, starting a dental school, so his, his staff and, and the supporters for doing that. Uh, so we see some mild to moderate growth in some existing programs based on capacities of things like clinical rotations, residencies, facilities, those types of things that you would kind of commonly think about. Uh, we do see that the alliance with our community health centers uh, may be one of the uh, wonderful opportunities for all of our areas. So we're looking to see 
on the Arizona campus how audiology, occupational therapy, physical therapy, uh, athletic training, uh, all of those uh, areas, OT, PT, fit within this opportunity that exists with community health centers. Because there are some community health centers that are very big systems. They even include hospitals and the rehabilitation services. Although we traditionally think of community health centers or FQHCs, federally qualified health centers, as being uh, uh, mainly oriented toward toward medicine and dentistry, which certainly is their their main business. And so we see that as an opportunity. If you think of a lot of medical schools, oftentimes you'll think of a university system that's associated with them. So, for instance, the University of Arizona has a large hospital and medical center associated with it. We, being a national school, don't really have that. We have uh, opportunities and partnerships with a number of different hospitals, which once again is actually pretty good because you spread your, your risk, but we know that the whole healthcare system is undergoing an evolution or de-evolution, depending on how you consider it, uh, and that we have to seek partners that, that we can hopefully build long-term relationships with that fit our mission. And this opportunity with community health centers uh, is certainly uh, an opportunity that all of our programs can look into. Uh, I will let Norman uh, comment on the uh, in any other areas, but specifically on on the uh, Indian American track within our uh, physician assistant program. And George Blue Spruce, I kind of consider our our um, leader. He's the uh, I believe the assistant dean or associate dean of American Indian Affairs for the Arizona School of Dental Oral Health. So early on, we asked uh, him, "What is the, the correct term?" that we should be using to identify our students, and it's Indian American, uh, because you have uh, a number of Native Americans, right? We have those that are out in the Western Pacific, those that are up in Alaska, and so American Indian is the, is the term that we've adopted and, and we use. So, Norman, if you want to give an update on that, I know uh, you may not have the minute update on that, but uh, uh, specifically toward the Native American track in our existing physician, American Indian track in our physician system program. Well, the, the question is very timely because this week I'm meeting with Randy Danielson in part on that matter. Um, right now the PA program is going through accreditation. Um, the site visitors are expected um, in December. Uh, that right now is, is the most important uh, thing on uh, Dr. Simon's mind who heads the program and Dr. Danielson. But um, I, that is on my agenda to talk with Dr. Danielson about this week. So uh, I will pursue that. I think what we, we really need to do is to reinvigorate the National Center for American Indian Health Professions. And in the past, the PA program uh, has been a fundamental part of that effort to have more American Indians on campus in our health professions program and that certainly has been and I intend that it will be an important part of our efforts going forward. We still have a very active outreach to the American Indian community. Uh, ATSU, as far as we have been able to discern, is the number one educator of American Indians in graduate health professions. So if you think about that, the number one uh, graduate uh, graduator of um, PAs in this country have been through A.T. Still University and for American Indian dentists have been through the uh, through A.T. Still University. And that's pretty amazing considering we're competing against state schools that can offer scholarships and all sorts of different incentives to expand some of their um, uh, diversity on their campuses. So uh, ATSU has done a wonderful job and while we have cohorts currently going through our PA program from our American Indian I think this question referred back to a time where we actually had a specific campus location uh, and we had a specific a track uh, that was advertised and marketed. You know, what's very interesting is that the students came to us and said, you know, we don't like being in a separate um, location. We want to be on, on your campus. And so that was out at um, some American Indian land that was given when Luke Air Force, I'm sorry, when uh, Williams Air Force Base closed down. This. Uh, 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 land was given to multi-American Indian communities, not just one specific community, which made an ideal place to put an educational center because you didn't have some of the um, discussions that you have when you put it on individual American Indian land related to the tribes. So the um, 
uh, we brought them back to campus, and that was their desire. So we kind of brought them back into the PA class, although, once again, it's not what we would call a separate track. We still have uh, an affinity that uh, and, and commitment to that, to that population. Good question. Sorry for the length of the answer, but there's a lot of stuff on there. Yes? Norman, sort of did you hear that? No, I didn't. Uh, so um, Adam uh, asked in our IPE, do we work with the National Center for Inter Interprofessional Education? Do we, do we have a relationship with them? Are they appropriate for what we do? Uh, well, we, we go each year to the IPEC conference. Um, and Barbara Maxwell certainly has many connections with um, interprofessional education groups both in the United States and abroad. So it's very important for us to um, know what is going on nationally and internationally with respect to IPE and, and to look at various programs that um, are innovative in terms of the type of education that they offer. So, um, if you will, the National Center in part serves as a clearinghouse for us in terms of what others are doing. But interestingly, what we can do, particularly with the Stomatology Initiative, is to our knowledge, no one else is doing this type of project right now. So, uh, in terms of becoming distinctive and preeminent, it's important for us to develop our own programs, but at the same time, we could get inspiration and ideas from what's happening nationally and internationally, and we can get that from the organizations that have been established to promote IPE. Adam, did that address that? Okay. Was there? Do you want a clarification? I mean, is there like a? Are we? A, do we pay a membership fee to them or? Okay. Okay, so evidently in this um, in this support um, overarching organization, there are some innovation institutes, eight of them around the country, and uh, Adam was wondering if perhaps that may be something we may be thinking of having being designated one of those innovation institutes. And it's possible. To, it's possible down the road that we can do so. Um, first, I think we we have to have um, a track record. Um, particularly with respect to a particular programmatic area. What I think Barbara Maxwell has been very successful at is developing these voluntary efforts between faculty, students, and staff to develop uh, IPE activities. I think what we need to do is to be known for something specific, that we have to be known for something different. Um, to be designated as such, uh, is a competitive process, particularly also with respect to getting grants and external funding. And so I think part of the overall idea of where IPE can help us with respect to preeminence is to be known for certain types of IPE activities, and that's the path what we're trying to take right now. Thank you. All right. Let's see. I'm going to see what, what, what time is it? Uh, we're getting close to the time. We're good. We have about 10 more minutes. So. Is All it right, baby you know? donkey time? <laughs> Would you like to hear Dr. Gevitz's story of his pets? <laughs> Go ahead, Dr. Gevitz. It didn't sound like there was much enthusiasm. <laughs> <laughs> I think they're waiting to hear before they commit. Well, I just want to say that, that I love Kirksville. I lived in Athens, Ohio before um, I, I lived in Kirksville. And Athens, Ohio had the same three ingredients that Kirksville has. Uh, one, it has either a Lowe's or a Home Depot. It has a Walmart and it has a Jimmy John's. But one of the things, one of the things that, that Kirksville has that Athens does not have are miniature baby donkeys, which live right across the street from me. And so when I took this job in, in where I'm centered in Kirksville, that all my New York friends, where I've been living the last four years, looked at me incredulously and could not believe that I was moving from New York to Kirksville, Missouri, not knowing that, as I said during Founders Day 
in many ways, it's home because I've had an association with Kirksville um, intermittent, but for 36, 37 years. But one of the joys that I have is to pick a location where there are miniature baby donkeys being raised across the street. And, and when I told my friends in New York where they asked me, where am I living in Kirksville? And I would say, right across the street from miniature baby donkeys, my New York friends who are never at a loss to say something, just open their mouths and we're all speechless. So it is, it is something that I enjoy uh, coming out in the morning and hear them braying or coming back at, from work, hear them braying that, that I, I feel I have a connection with the earth. <laughs> Yes, Jason. Dr. Gavitz, you probably don't know this. You know a lot of history, but because we just got a postcard from a student who said, I love, and he's writing home about the events in Kirkville. This is from the 1900s. I love to go over to Dr. Still's house and watch his little home. <laughs> <laughs> it is a tradition with our founder. So. Did, you, did you hear that, Norman? I, I, I think that was Jason, but I didn't hear what he said. Well, he found a, a postcard from the early 1900s that a student had written home about, uh, about how they would go over to Dr. Stillhouse and uh, watch the little ponies. So uh, they're, 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 I'll leave it at that. So will I. <laughs> Dr. Wendell. Uh, yes. Yeah. No donkeys on the lawns in Arizona. So. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Wendell. <laughs> Excellent. Very good. All right. So uh, I hope that was helpful. Uh, we'll try to do these at least twice a year. Um, obviously, you have the um, uh, idea box that you can s submit things to all the time. We have, we get some great ideas. I think you know if you notice the less. Uh, um, Driving into the area where the Thompson Campus Center is, there's less of a bump there, so you don't bottom out. Uh, you would think that would have been intuitive to us, but it was inspired by uh, something in the idea box. We did try to put an uh, umbrella out in the little medicinal garden area, but the, uh, there's for some reason that corner of the winds blow that thing up, and it, you know, we had it there two days, and it was going around the parking lot, and the person said, uh, I understand. Why don't we not take put that out there? Because I, I asked her to be in charge of the umbrella and we're, you know, keeping an eye on the weather. And so she got tired of running down there every 10 or 15 minutes to remove the umbrella. But uh, that's kind of the two extremes. But there have been a lot of great suggestions, ideas that come to the office, and we try to um, uh, put them into the uh, the appropriate pipeline and um, get some of those things done if we can. The ones that that are kind of our dream goals, uh, we keep on there somewhere, but we don't. Uh, we don't assume that some of those things we'll be able to do, and we let the individual know that sends the, the ideas in. But it's you just never know. It may not be its time now, but it may be time in five to ten years. So. Okay. All right. One last question. You got a one, two. Okay. Did you did this? Did you guys get together ahead of time in your group and say, "No, I'm just completely kidding." <laughs> I guess I don't know the, the true situation here, but as far as our third and fourth year medical students are concerned. How are we as far as slots that are given? I, I assume they're given to us. Are, are, are we? Well, yeah. <laughs> but yes. Are, are we doing okay? Do we have placement? Are sure. we getting close to capacity? Sure. sure. Well, I think that's a great question for Dr. Gevitz. I think it's the one thing that keeps all the team up at night, the team that, uh, that meets once a month and we meet individually with team members. That's probably the thing that keeps us up at night is uh, we know that to handle this future need, we're going to have to have some type of increased capacity in clinical training during all, in all of our areas during their pre-graduate, and then in some of the professions that are requiring more and more graduate types of things, uh, how do we keep that in balance? So uh, for the first time uh, coming up in graduate medical education, the next year or two we will have the number of graduates equaling the number of overall residency slots. Now remember that's all residency slots. It's not maybe what our students prefer, what others prefer. It's just a it's just a big number. Uh, once we hit that, then that becomes a, a bigger issue of the expansion of medical schools and new medical schools. Uh, now, once again, on the Hill, they're aware of this. And they're trying to push funding. And in fact, in the Affordable Care Act, there is a whole separate part of that that is designed to increase residencies to expand the capabilities to 
to give care to people. It's right in there, and it's actually law. It's been passed. It's been passed. So it's there. And every person on, uh, in Congress understands the importance of GME. And the reason is because they know that if they don't get that done, it directly affects them and their families. And they don't want to be the person that didn't plan ahead for the health of America. That being said, so we, uh, our rotations are earned through many years of relationships, uh, through mutual support. Uh, when one organization has difficulty, they work with the other organization and vice versa. Um, sometimes they survive or don't survive corporate takeovers, transitions from profits to non-for-profits. Uh, it, it is a constant uh, game of chess that everybody is working on from, you know, what we might consider, you know, the UCLA's and, and the Harvard's to, uh, you know, the, the podiatry schools who currently have a moratorium on opening new uh, podiatry schools because of the lack of clinical rotations. So this, we are... We have to advocate um, on all levels to keep our, our um, clinical uh, rotations open. And we're fortunate that we have alumni uh, that we can often turn to when we need something and pick up the phone and say, hey, listen, could you help us out with rotations? We found that extremely um, true when our PA program had its accreditation issues. So I will let uh, Dr. Gevitz uh, maybe discuss current capacity, but to my understanding, it's a constant, you know, chase. We have people that their full-time jobs are to do nothing but go out there and look at new opportunities, sustain the ones that are already uh, in development, and, and kind of blaze the way. And we think the community health centers are just in that infant stage of working with ATSU, although they're a major player for us right now, but we think the potential there is even greater. Dr. Gevitz? It's, it's an absolute excellent question, and it's, it's an existential question as well. As Dr. Phelps said, that, that uh, it is our DO programs and our other health professions programs as well. Finding sufficient clinical experiences both at the pre-doctoral level and at the post-doctoral level. Uh, we've seen a change in, in the scenario. The old osteopathic way was volunteerism. It was giving back, uh, and that's how we were able to get sufficient number of our uh, medical students precepted. Now, however, we have great competition. Uh, many hospitals have closed. We see the impact of Caribbean medical schools that are paying top dollar for rotations um, around the country. And now what we're finding is for many of our programs that we are having to pay our preceptors. And this represents a paradigm shift for us because our efforts, as the president said earlier, have been to try to keep our tuition low. But now we're paying for activities that were once provided as give back to the school from which individuals graduated from that all of this has become monetized. On the postdoctoral level, it becomes even more acute. 2,000 uh, MDs, graduates of US medical schools, had to go into the scramble in order to find slots because they didn't match. Uh, there is the idea that somehow that international medical graduates will be necessarily the first to be squeezed out as the cap is hit in terms of what CMS is willing to pay for. And that's not necessarily true because on the East Coast, where many of these residency positions are, the head of residency programs are themselves international medical graduates. So what we really need to do is to increase the number of OGME, osteopathic graduate medical education slots. We have started an initiative, um, and we're hopeful on this, but again, it's at the very beginning, of trying to work with VA hospitals. The osteopathic profession uh, for many years was squeezed out and did not have opportunities in VA hospitals. But now what is happening in the VA system is that instead of building VA hospitals per se, they are building large ambulatory care centers which are more akin to community health centers 
And what we are trying to do is establish relationships with um, VA centers All right. Well, what he's talking, you got uh, no. Of Houston, we have a problem. <laughs> Mute button. All right, I've got it. So, anyways, he's working with. Uh, we're working with the VAs on expanding some some residency uh, programs, residency opportunities. Now, I want to tell you some great things this university has done and is doing specifically regarding that. Now, it's happening at all programmatic levels. But last year, um, we received from HRSA uh, $13,050,000 to, uh, to establish 29 primary care residencies in a community-based um, uh, community health centers. And those were all full, many with our graduates. And uh, it was about 10% of all the residencies that were started by Aesthetic Medical Schools came out of this, this university. Uh, Tom McWilliams, uh, as he left the dean position in Arizona, uh, was brought on specifically to develop graduate um, medical education. Uh, uh, Dr. LeBaire is part of that group here that's working very hard on that and moving those things forward. And, and we are well aware of that. Now, let, here's what I think that you heard, but is really the catch in this, is we're competing against schools that start every quarter, what we start once a year. So imagine every quarter they start 200 students. They are really not concerned if someone fails or passes. That's not, once again, the, the corporate for-profit nature of these Caribbean schools, not all of them, but many of them, is that we start hundreds and hundreds of students. We know some are going to fail out. And, uh, you know, so they're able to take larger sums of dollars because there are two to three times maybe more students. And they can go to a hospital and say, hey, we can give you a million dollars a year for clinical rotations. And so now what's happening is those hospital administrators are saying, well, I've got to choose between an MD or DO school that doesn't pay, or I can take a million dollars to put it to our bottom line and be more profitable. And that's where we are. And that's really where the battle is. So you see this escalation of the cost for clinical rotations. Now imagine what that's going to happen to all DO and MD schools if now you have to take every tuition dollar, what we do is we kind of front load it, right? We front load years one and two, and then we send the students out for years three and four. But if you actually look at how we spend the resources, it's mainly front loaded in year one and two, but we give them four years to pay for their DO school, right? We don't collect it all up front. It's a little bit like a mortgage. Well, the, the paradigm shift will be that maybe we will have to use technology and prepare our faculty in different ways to survive a paradigm shift in which the dollar now is distributed equally over four years. It can't be front-loaded into years one and two because we can't really double tuition, right? So this was going to present a very interesting paradigm in general for the whole um, medical and health professional education. It's not just ATSU. It's the whole way, the whole thing is moving. So you see companies respond by forming partnerships with people and organizations like we're doing with community health centers. Uh, you see uh, hospital systems being sold out of universities, but with a agreement for a period of time to provide clinical rotations. Uh, you see some schools and some systems buying hospitals, which usually doesn't work. <laughs> uh, and so you see all of this going on with this positioning of how they're going to provide clinical rotations and enough residencies. And it is like a giant chess game played at the highest level. And I think we've got great players at that at that. Uh, at the board for us, um, but it's gonna it's gonna require um, that we really watch that within our within our DO schools, and there's a whole system that's set up for that. Uh, keeping in mind, we still have two dental schools, we have a virtual um, online uh, school, and we have the Ashes programs that we still obviously need to put as much focus and attention to the success of all those, uh, and I think we do that very well. We do a pretty darn good job. All right. Any other final questions? Um, Randy, is your group, does it, does it, did it make a list of grievances? Uh, are you just going to walk out on us or anything like that? Or, or, did we do okay? <laughs> but I want to thank this, uh, uh, folks on this campus for, once again, supporting this very cool uh, uh, capital annual campaign, the Unity Campaign. Um, it, it was very uh, heartwarming to see how everybody has stepped up and responded 
to those people who have gone out and have said, hey, listen, if you can give to us, I think we can do great things for this university. And we've seen a tremendous increase in the support on this campus. Now we're going to challenge the Mesa campus to make sure that they can do it in our virtual campus to see how they can continue that support. And that's so important when we go to the Wright Foundation or we go to, you know, a foundation, Missouri Foundation for Health. The first thing that when I'm sitting at the table they ask, the very first thing they ask is, tell us about the support that you get from your board of trustees and your employees. That right there sets the tone. If you can't walk in that room and say, we have 100% and basically 50% or more, you know, you they, they kind of you know that they're graded down a notch just to start with. And if you can say, here's where we are, great, let's move on to the next thing. And this energy starts to bubble up and it's created. So it's very, very important that we all participate in the success of this university and our jobs. Thanks for time, Dr. Thanks. Phelps. Thanks, Dr. everybody. Gavins. Thank you. Great. <laughs> Good. Thank you. He's back. <laughs> Thanks, Lord. We'll see you Saturday. <laughs>